Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Elena Gross and Julie Enzer, two uh, illustrious guests. You may have seen Julie before. She's kind of a friend of the show at this point. And we are here to celebrate the publication of this wonderful book that they have put together outright. The Speeches That Shaped LGBTQ Literary Culture. It's been a wonderful um, read for me. And before we get started, let me tell you a little about our guests. Julia R. Enzer is the author of four poetry collections, including Avowed and the editor of the complete works of Pat Parker and Sister Love, The Letters of Audre Lorde and Pat Parker, 1974 to 1989. Enzer edits and publishes Sinister Wisdom, a multicultural lesbian literary art journal, literary and art journal, and you live in central Florida. Nice and warm there now, I bet. Well, today it's cold, it's only up to 65. You know, so by Floridian standards, we're freezing. <laughs> well, um, Elena, you live in Oakland? I live in Oakland. I am currently sitting in San Francisco right now. Oh, also kind of warm compared to Vermont anyway. Both of yeah, them. comparatively. It's it's an, it's a decent day today. I think it's like, uh, I think we are up to 59 degrees or something like that. It's like the low 60s today. Oh, oh that's lovely. Um, Elena is an independent writer, curator, and culture critic living in Oakland, California. Her research specializes in conceptual and material abstractions of the body, and representations of identity in fine art, photography, and popular media. Welcome to both of you. And thank yeah. you for joining us. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Let's start with the book. Um, how did it come together? Do you want to start, Elena? Sure, yeah. Um, so for how it started for me was that I was invited to be a part of this project um, uh, that E.G. Crichton was um, developing called Outlook, the Birth of the Queer. It was kind of a look back at the Outlook uh, publication, um, the first uh, gay and lesbian quarterly. And she invited these different, um, different folks, artists, writers, scholars, activists, um, basically to respond to an issue, an old issue of Outlook. So she kind of match make, you know, she did her like matchmaker thing and kind of matched us with an issue. And um, in the issue that I received, um, you know, you could select anything to kind of respond to and in whatever, you know, fashion, uh, you know, you, you saw it. And so I was really struck by the ads for the black and white ads for the first uh, out, outright conference in 1990 in San Francisco. And just, you know, in diving in and starting to research what the conferences were, because I had um, was previously completely unfamiliar with them. Um, I was one amazed that that was my first introduction to to the conferences, but then just um, just so overjoyed, just imagining what uh, just imagining what these conferences would have been like, would to be in the room with you know all of these writers who I'd been reading um, you know on my own or through you know other you know academic research for so long and people who I really admired, art writers who I never knew about um, you know and. I ended up writing um, kind of a responsive essay around um, how important the conferences uh, were and, you know, why it felt, um, why I wished, what, what I hoped would be, you know, how we could revisit this, this event as a means of thinking about what this could look like, um, you know, in our future, in our present day or future. Um, and so, so after that uh, project, EG put together a panel um, of, of different respondents from that project for the Queer History Conference in San Francisco and invited me to, to read uh, my essay, which I did. 
And in the audience was uh, Julie, um, who was, you know, kind of sitting like enraptured with like a twinkle in her eye. Um, and after the panel was over, you know, she she came up to me and said, you know, I really think that this could be this could be a book. And so that kind of began um, that summer after that conference, like the slow build up to, you know, can we do this? Yeah, I think we can. Um, and so that's really how, for, for, in my mind, that's kind of how the project came together. And if I may interject before we go to Julie, I had the privilege of reading that um, speech that you delivered on that panel and I loved it. And I really love that you mentioned T. Kareen, whom I mm -hmm. have admired for years. And of course, Dorothy Allison. And I loved in Skin, her tribute to Bertha Harris, another writer whom we need to remember. So, mm. you know, your, uh, your speech was very historically resonant for me. And so- Oh, thank you. You can read the whole thing on your website, right? Yes. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. So then Julie was in the audience and- well, and so, you know, we start we started talking about this and one of the things I didn't want to do was work was was work on the project much before we had a publisher. And I had been having some conversations with Kim Guinta at Rutgers University Press and not kind of had the right project. But we pitched this to her and um, she had heard about the conference before and Jeremy Granger, who's the director of marketing at Rutgers University Press, had attended the conference. Um, so there was lots of kismet there with the press and they signed on and that's when we um, got serious and, and said, all right, what does, what does the book look like? Um, and I, I can't I, I think we were kind of in the pandemic. We I, we signed the contract before the pan, maybe just before the pandemic. And we did, there was a, and so we were like doing some research and we were having some stuff, but then the pandemic came. Um, and in some ways I think of it really as a pandemic project um, in part because like we were listening to all these speeches and thinking about this conference in this time when we couldn't go out of our houses. Um, so it, it carried even, I think, more kind of intellectual and emotional weight um, with the possibility of gathering with people um, at a time when we were in this um, chosen isolation for everyone's health. And what's interesting, what struck me immediately is how well researched it is. And so how did, how did you do all that research in the pandemic? Yeah, it was definitely complicated because, you know, at the, you know, obviously Julie and I are separated by, you know, she's on one side of the country and I'm on the other, but then there's also um, archives and papers of all of these writers. Um, you know, libraries were shuttered or were, you know, shuttered universities. So being able to even access information became, um, ex we had to get very creative um, around um, finding you know, so it was it was a lot of different things like finding YouTube videos, finding um, audio, you know, tapes and Julie can talk more about the tapes specifically um, reaching out to researchers to, you know, is there any way that like you're still in the office or going into the office, you know, one or two times a week that we could like, you know, kind of access uh, these files. Um, and so it all kind of came together in not the most elegant of ways, but um, but yeah, it was it was pretty interesting to kind of embark on something so research intensive at a time when um, there were even, you know, there's always kind of access issues when it comes to archival material. And this was the biggest access issue of them all in a, in a certain way. And so, um, yeah, we just kind of, we just uh, kept chugging along and tried not to let it deter us. Mm -hmm. Well, I was able to, the uh, outright 90, some of the speeches are on YouTube. And I listened to some of them and I thought, oh my gosh, because, you know, you really, they're not very good. You can't really hear that well. And I thought, did they, how did they do this? How did you do this? Did you have the, I mean, was, was the audio pretty bad usually or difficult? And did you transcribe or what are the nuts and bolts of this um, process? All, all of the above, you know, so we, so I had a couple tapes that people had given me, like they had attended the conference. 
Um, and a, a good friend of mine, um, he mailed he mailed me not only the tapes that he had, but like programs from the two that he had attended. Um, and then we had the YouTube ones and we use yeah. a transcription service for that one. Right. Yeah. And we used to, and um, it's, it's amazing in the past um, decade or so transcription that's um, computer driven has gotten much better. It's not perfect, right? Yeah. There's still a lot of cleanup and editing with it, but um, you know, it's much faster than, than human transcription. Um, and for some of the pieces, like the John Preston piece, Preston did publish versions of it in his book. And so we took the transcript compared to the book version and sort of um, sifted out like mining for gold mm -hmm. um, from that. Similarly, the um, Samuel Delaney piece is published in his book. We listened and did a yeah. transcription of his full speech, which was riveting. It's it's long, and um, but it's this incredible story that's just spreads out like a flower and then all folds back in on itself at the end. Um, and so, it, you know, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of sifting through transcriptions mm -hmm. and audio and, um, mm -hmm. and listening for what's, um, and thinking about what's gonna make a great volume when we were all done. And that, I tried to follow along on some of the speeches and I noticed some editing. Would you say you heavily edited or um, shortened or sharpened? We did. We definitely did some editing, um, some condensing. Um, one, just we had, you know, because the manuscript had a word count um, that we had to, you know, kind of be consist considerate of um, and wanting to make sure that we had as um, as full of a cater of um, writers represented, but also, you know, being, having to fit within a specific, um, within specific parameters. So that was one consideration. Some speeches, when you listen to the tape, you can hear how how they come across when delivered as a speech doesn't really read the same way on the page. So there were some considerations there. Um, some speeches that had been, you know, like in, in, as Julie was kind of mentioning, a number of the speeches have appeared in other collections. So wanting to really wanting to choose works that um, are lesser known or, you know, or, you know, perhaps they're in a collection that is out of print now. So really thinking about, um, you know, what's going to make this a, you know, a special kind of collection as opposed to just a reprint of a reprint of a reprint. Um, so yeah, there were a lot of, there were a few considerations in that required, but I wouldn't say that, I, I would say for most of the speeches, I wouldn't say that most of the speeches are heavily edited. I think we tried to make sure the material was as, as consistent um, with the original as, as we were able to. Well, I don't I know, Julie. Go ahead, Julie. Well, I was because, you know, I think part of it was also uh, one of the things we were also really thinking about is sort of balancing the experience of what your readers have when you sit down to read a book. You have a different sort of expectation than when you sit down to hear somebody speak. So we wanted to both fulfill the reader expectation, but also preserve a little bit of that excitement of being in a space where someone's speaking, um, you know, often speaking from a prepared speech, um, but there's, even from a prepared speech, there's still the intimacy and excitement of the, the oral tradition. Um, and one of the things that I know I um, deliberated a lot about, there's a part in Allen Ginsberg's speech where he gives the phone number of the, the FCC. FCC. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we went back and forth because I was like, I know reading this in a book, like you're going to be like, why, why is this phone number here? And I don't even know if the phone number is still correct. Um, so, so I was like, oh, we should just cut this. And then, um, but we, but the, and, and I think Ginsburg's speech was, um, I mean, like, I think it would have been exciting to be in the room with him, but he also read a little bit in a monotone and like, and, and, but was equal, it was both a monotone, but also this passionate thing of telling everyone you free speech is so vital to us as gay people that you must call this number now. And he kept repeating yeah. it. And that, that, like when he gets to the number, like that is really when the, you can, you can hear his voice shift. You can, 
picture his body language shifting like that's where it really hits this crescendo for him and yeah. so yeah I was glad because I think that hopefully you re you get that from reading it that he's like no I'm gonna stop but like the what he'd already had prepared to like insist that everyone in this room write down this number and like insist that you call it as soon as the speech is over as soon as the speech concludes and I think yeah that's one of those things that you get from being in the room that you don't always get from reading a book and so being able to balance that was really, was really important. I know what you mean, because for example, when I, I love the essay Semphill, Hemphill mm -hmm. speech, and I didn't realize until we got to Mini Bruce Pratt at the end, that people had hissed that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so again, um, you were able to, to convey it, not in the speech itself. And I listened to that recording and you couldn't hear it. It seemed like, you know, he was resoundingly applauded. And that's such an important speech, I think, that you know applies to contemporary times as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't realize you had a word limit because one of my questions, in the beginning, um, in the 1990 um, conference, there were two plenaries, one involved AIDS and the other was lesbian and gay literature in the marketplace. And my question was going to be why you chose not to include that. Uh, the word limit is probably one answer. And what else? Well, I the word limit, and also we did. I don't. Uh, we didn't have tapes of that. Oh, now, I hear that there's a full collection of the tapes for nineteen for the nineteen ninety outright at the. Um, um, GLBT Historical Society in San Francisco, but they were closed during the time that we were doing most of the research. So that was one. Um, I had hired um, someone who, who photographed um, all of the materials at Northeastern University sort of related to the conference. So we had, so I had this kind of like photographic trove of um, the all of the program books and things like that so we could piece together things about the conference and Northeastern University archivist Molly Brown was working during part of the um, pandemic and did um, digitized copies of a couple of the speeches for us as well as some photographs um, but the his the Historical Society in San Francisco was closed the whole time. So I've actually not heard the speeches from that panel, which I think must have been an amazing one. I know it. Um, but another, another reason I thought might have been that so much has changed. And that is really clear from this collection also. And in fact, I think you might say at some point that uh, it was before, oh, you said in the other interview that I loved, that we'll talk about in a minute, um, that you couldn't, you had to announce room changes, you couldn't send it around on people's phones, and, you know, um, technology has produced so much since the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I have, since you mentioned um, hiring somebody, I, let me ask you about research assistants. Because it's so impressive all, you know, did you have research assistants? Or did you do it all yourself? Well, so I I hired somebody that, that went up to the Northeastern Library and I highlighted all the folders that I wanted her to look at and everything. And, and Elaine, I think this was like really early on. I'm not sure we were, I don't know if we were working together at that point or we had just like sort of started mm -hmm. thinking about things. Um, but um, Malika Fitzhugh um, did that for me. But no, I mean, research assistants, and in some ways you're talking about um, an old, uh, another time, a time when we also talked to, talk, used, uh, talked on phones that hung on the wall. Um, <laughs> You know, I think um, neither of us, uh, while we were working on the book, had university appointments and the things that come with that, which is, of mm -hmm. course, research <laughs> assistant yeah. and those sorts of things. So we well, we did it. We yeah. were our own research assistants. And I applaud that because research is really important and it doesn't reside only in the academy as you have demonstrated. Um, Judy Gron says, um, if there is a gay 
or lesbian writer who has never done any organizing, that person is taking a free ride. And that seems like a light motif that runs throughout all of the speeches, the relationship between activism and writing. And Sarah Schulman underscored mm -hmm. in her speech when she says, do your writing during the day and then go out and lick envelopes another day. Well, go out and pick it or then go out and do activism. Do you have any response to this? I think they straddled it beautifully in the book you put together. Uh, do you have any response to that? I mean, I think, especially with um, both uh, Judy and Sarah's, you know, being, you know, the first conference of the, you know, the first instance of the conference and also it being 1990, I think you really feel an urgency um, because this is, you know, the height of the AIDS crisis. Um, and so I think there's a real sense of, I think it's something that we, you know, can and should look to and learn from at all periods of time. But I think there's a real sense that, you know, people are dying, like not in an abstract sense, not, you know, but our friends, our family members, people who should be at this conference right now are all dying every single day. And no one's, no one cares. The, you know, the people, people who should care do not care. And so it's really up to us to care for not only what, you know, not only what we do are the literary production, um, you know, the, the, the written word, um, but we need to care for one another and we need to care for our community because no one else is going to do it. And we kind of, you know, it, in, in a, much more in, in a similar impassioned, but maybe less shaming way than, you know, say like a Larry Kramer, I think they're really trying to activate the people in the room um, to, to stay true to the work that they're doing because it's necessary, because it's needed, but also to galvanize everyone around, you know, our kind of collective, um, our collective struggles and our collective oppressions and to, to really bolster one another and, um, to, to help each other out to, to we're you know the only ones who are going to well, we are in charge of saving ourselves no one else is going to be here to do it so let's get off our asses and do it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well um i've come across a certain um mindset that the 90s were a terrible time and of course it was but i also think of all the activism of course there's aids activism the lesbian avengers were active mm -hmm. and there was so much pushback going on that is often overlooked too. So it, you know, it's terrible the things that were happening, um, but there was also pushback that really was significant and energizing, I think, for a lot of the writers. And I think it applies today, don't you, that activism is, you know, AIDS is still with us. Um, it may be not be, it may not be as pressing as it once was, but there are still issues that we, as writers and um, artists, need to push back against. I mean, you know, we think of the culture wars in the 90s and Jesse Helms and look what's going on here in mm -hmm. 2022. Mm -hmm. so I think, point. you know, I keep, I, I've been thinking a lot um, about, about Judy's challenge um, because I also think one of the things that she was she was speaking to at that point that's that does get a little lost is she was speaking to really the need for men and women to work together. Um, and I think that was one of the things that this um, outright conference coming out of the Outlook magazine, like one of the things that Outlook really took on as a fundamental, um, commitment and challenge is like, how are men and women going to work together? Mm -hmm. And in the late 80s, that was, that was in the air very much um, after, I think, a period where a lot of lesbians were, um, had been organizing with women in feminist communities, in lesbian only communities, and there was a real kind of sense of the need for co-gender work. Um, so I do think that that's one of the, the resonances of what she says. Um, and, and then, of course, Ginsburg talking about the, the challenges um, to free speech, about the censorship that was happening. Um, I, think we're, I think there are different registers today. You know, I think that writing communities more broadly are really um, 
invested in organizing against authoritarianism. And one of the things we've sort of seen come out even in the past two or three weeks is um, so much translation work of Ukrainian writers um, mm -hmm. and really of people thinking about how does writing happen under authoritarian threats. Um, similar things came out when Trump was elected in the United States. Um, so I think that there are different registers. I guess one of the things I kind of wonder about is, uh, and one of the reasons why, why I wanted to do this book is what are the unique challenges that LGBTQ writers should be organizing around um, to, to engage the challenges of the moment. Um, and I think, you know, um, Ginsburg really was making vital connections between um, queer work and broader attacks on free speech. And I think there's there's the need for us to do that work. Um, and I think it is happening. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily um, distilled right now with the same intensity that outright was distilling the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that speaks to the end of Elena's speech um, that she delivered in 2016 on the panel. Um, where she says, um, she quotes Laverne Gage Habib, who says um, of her need to write and her need to read more explicitly gay and lesbian writing, we will fight to keep it. I'll fight to keep it because I've got to have it. And so I think the, the need is equally pressing that you um, announced so eloquently in 2016. Uh, and I think, I have no evidence for this, but so much, I think a lot of resistance um, was seeded during that period and has continued um, and expanded and proliferated in various ways. Um, let's talk to a little bit. Well, I want to mention uh, Melvin Dixon's wonderful remarks apropos of AIDS. Um, the title of his talk is I'll be somewhere listening for my name, um, in which he talks about his friend Greg who died, who's going to be listening for his name. And, you know, um, Dixon is going to die shortly after the speech and he'll be listening for his name. Um, and let me use this opportunity to call our audience's attention to a wonderful interview with our two guests that occurred um, by, that was conducted at the, by the National Poetry Foundation off the shelf series. And it's called Listen for My Name. And you both talk very um, cogently about all the issues that your book raises. And that, that interview can be found at www.poetryfoundation.org. So I encourage our audience to tune in to it. And it, it uh, explores a lot of avenues raised by the book and talks about the 90s and the difficulties therein. Um, can we talk for a minute about Christos, a wonderful writer who's included? And I'd like to read a little of what she says because I think it's, it's timely. Um, she says, as long as we butcher language ourselves, such as writing the word blind to mean ignorance or insensitivity, we are cooperating with our oppressors. When we hold events in inaccessible places or charge rates that could buy a bag of groceries, we imitate the very people whose aim it is to eliminate us. I applaud that sentiment and I think it applies today. Do you have any response to those remarks? Very pithy, I think. I, I was gonna say um, two things. One, just in relationship to the Melvin Dixon, um, is that another powerful thing about listening to different speeches is at some point during all of the conferences, they lifted up the names of people who died from AIDS. Mm -hmm. And we listened to that in, in two or three different conferences and it was, um, the, it, it was really just a stunning moment, again, reminding us of the power of what happens when we collectively gather, because you could hear 
it, it, it sounds odd to say, but you could hear this very large um, convention center room and the sort of shuffling of over a thousand people in the rooms and the names first being read from the stage, but then people standing up and saying them. And um, it was just, they, they were always incredible um, transcendent moments of the conference. And in Christos's um, speech, um, she says that um, a, a little bit before the part you quoted, of the 60 original members of gay American Indians in San Francisco, only 10 have survived because of AIDS. Um, and so I think there's just so many kind of imprints in this book that remind us of um, the devastation and loss that AIDS brought, um, but then also of how it really taught us to speak um, to power. And I think that's the, the quote that you brought from Christos um, also inspires that. And the other thing I'll just say about Christos is everyone should go and um, read and discover her poetry. I mean, that, that sort of attention to language, to words, to how they're arranged on the page, to their resonances within it, um, I think really characterizes her writing. And um, she's an extraordinary, extraordinary poet. And apropos of the naming ritual, you know, um, I was thinking, someone I was speaking with this morning talked about their their workplace naming the names of people who died. And I think that might have begun. I thought of this conference and I think it might have begun there because it's a tradition that's been kind of almost incorporated into the mainstream. I mean, didn't Elizabeth Warren list the names of transgender people who have been uh, murdered in a political arena? So another example of how groundbreaking uh, the outright conferences were. Um, then uh, let's talk a little about the craft of writing, which appears, you know, it's a writer's conference after all, and people are talking about what to do with your writing. And Jewel Gomez on page 153 of my volume mentions writing and says, what I'm actually saying is using our political eye, we can approach our writing and just as importantly, the business of writing with integrity. And that the idea of writing with integrity, I think is very provocative. How do you respond to the idea of writing with integrity? What's writing with integrity to you? Well, I think what I love about that, um, about that excerpt specifically is like, is, is when she says the business of writing with integrity, right? I think there's a real sense of you know, being gay and lesbian writers, um, writing from a place of authenticity and a place of um, of speaking to one's experience, um, and and not you know, and not sanitizing, not um, you know, not reducing, not diminishing um, the very real you know the the realities of of you know a queer life at this moment in time, as a means. I I think a lot about the many turns to make. Um, to make queer writing or like queer art content in general sexy that I think we're kind of experiencing, you know, like sellable um, and, and, pal and palatable in certain ways, especially kind of coming out of the 90s and into, you know, talk about authoritarianism and into like kind of, the, you know, the Bush years as well, you know, coming out of the Reagan years, but then going into the Bush years and that kind of long stretch and obviously up until where we, up to where we are now. And I think this writing, this idea of the business of writing with integrity is very much staying true to is 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 writing without fear um and i think it really speaks to what ginsburg's saying i think it speaks to a lot of that um it's speaking back against uh the authoritarianism as julie was pointing out it's speaking back to um these attacks on these sens censorious attacks on on queer writing it's speaking back to the ways that uh, marginalized communities are being silenced um are being criminalized um, in certain ways. So I think that those are all the things that I kind of think of is, you know, is important, is, is important for um, the gay and lesbian writer is to, is to write without fear and to write from a place of, um, of authenticity about, about one's life and about um, the world around you. Julie? 
Well, and I, I really connect it with, um, uh, with Preston's um, talk, John Preston talking about the work he did in Maine um, in the last years of his life. Um, you know, in the, in the, in the go-go seventies, as I understand um, John Preston's narrative, which I'm still discovering and learning about myself, but in the go-go seventies, he was writing great erotic porn um, for gay men. And, um, and also, you know, doing do, like, he's, he has such a great biography, like founding the advocate and other sorts of things, right? So, um, but he really, and he describes himself and, and Joan Nussel writes about this beautifully. He describes himself as a pornographer. Um, and then in the eighties, um, he moves up to Maine. Um, he knows that he has AIDS himself. Um, he knows that he's going to die and he starts working at the Maine AIDS project and doing um, essentially oral histories as people are telling their life stories and he's recording them. And, um, and you know, and I, and, and I imagine he alludes to like some people diminish this work, sort of say like, you know, uh, um, I think very much in a tradition of, um, you know, like, like, like John Preston should have been um, aiming to be Proust or another kind of writer that's really recognized in the, um, in the high literary world as greatness. And here he is doing these oral histories of dying people in Maine. Um, and he says, you know, that this is the greatest work he can do to be of service to his community. And, um, I think that's also a part of the integrity that Jewel is talking about. Um, that to do to do work with integrity is thinking about partially where will I, how will I be appraised by history, but also how am I serving my community, the people who really nurture and lift me up. Mm -hmm. um, you each have been influenced, no doubt, by this project. Um, what essays have influenced you the most and how? It's a hard question because they're all wonderful and they all affected me variously. I'm gonna let my dogs out in one minute and, and, then, I'll, and then I can come back, but Elena can start. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll start. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess I'd have to start with the the first one in a sense, or, or the first the first um, of the speeches that I, you know, when I was first uh, working on the essay for the Outlook uh, for the Birth of the Queer Project that really um, kind of inspired me, which was Sarah Schulman's uh, speech um, and the responsibility of the writer. Um, and, and again, exactly as we've been talking about this idea of, you know, you doing your work at night, but then putting your body on the line. And if you're not, you're kind of, you know, um, like that, you know, that's, like uh, the responsibility of the writer at this time in this moment in time is to be both is to be both writer and activist and and your activism can take place via your writing in certain ways but there are also you know how there's also other avenues of mutual aid avenues of showing up for your community that are that are necessary um so i think that's a speech that i that was the first speech that i really connected with that like led me to you know become interested in this project, but also one that stays with me a lot now. Um, there, but there are a couple others that I think, um, Patrick Califia's speech, um, and, you know, really not, uh, it kind of similar to Preston, really, you know, seeing themselves as a pervert and really, you know, and the importance of, you know, of, of queer desire, of, of sexuality and queer desires being necessary um, it, being part of their community, their literary community, as well as their community outside of outside of writing, and that not being um, compartmentalized for the sake of being palatable, of, for the sake of being accepted in a certain way, and those things being necessarily entwined and making the writing better and making you know um, the community better. Um, I think, especially because there are so many divisions along those lines, even now. I think that's a conversation that we have every year in the lead up to June. Um, you know, so I, I, that's like, that was also an essay that I think, um, really resonated with me as well. Um, but of course, 
so many of them, you know, I could pick out moments from almost each and every one. Julie. You know, I'm, I, one thing I want to highlight is the way, uh, particularly at the, after the conference moved to Boston, they would do a closing plenary with a performance by um, a, some kind of performance artist. Um, one that we included in the book is a selection from Luisa Alfaro. Um, and Judith Katz has a wonderful story of like from uh, Alfaro came out on stage in skates and started performing um, his, his final show, his final, the final performance of the conference. And, um, you know, I think the ways the conferences had a commitment to really thinking not only about writing, but across queer arts, um, I, I, that feels like an, another important element of what people were doing. Um, you know, I talked earlier about how Judy's mobilizing, um, a shared sense of solidarity between gay men and lesbians. I think people were also experiencing solidarity as writers, but also reaching for and thinking about solidarity as artists, mm -hmm. right? You know, performance art and um, other kinds of theater that were at. Peggy Shaw has a selection in this. Peggy also performed um, during one of the conferences. Um, and I think that those kind of linkages are really important um, it, 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 as we sort of think about the conference, but also as we think about queer letters more broadly. Um, and then, you know, Essex Hemphill's speech also, um, where he gives, um, and, and where he talks about um, his critique of the Maplethorpe photographs and is booed um, by the conference, um, but is also this sort of reminder of how important it is that we, um, that we listen to people with different perspectives, um, that we may feel um, galvanized and inspired by the ways that Ellen Ginsberg um, speaks against censorship and we may, you know, and, and part of that was the censorship of Maplethorpe, but that there are other stories and other perspectives on that same um, incident that are also important for us to hear and listen to. And, um, and to me, neither, the, to me, the two don't diminish one another, but they help us have a more full picture of what's happening in our world and how it's affecting people in different ways so that we can think more intensively about how, how we want to be and how we want to respond. Um, so those are you know, some of the, the ones that stand out to me. And I love that they both talk about Maplethorpe because it's like the speeches inform one another. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's part of an ongoing conversation. And it reminds you that this was live. You know, so, you know, Allen Ginsberg gives his keynote and Elsa Temple is listening to this and thinking about his place in the world as a black gay man and thinking about, you know, it, it reminds you that, you know, it's not just responsive in the sense of, you know, we th often think about people being inspired or being influenced by writers who of another generation who came before them, reading them and then responding in kind. And this is a writer of another generation that you're in the same room as and, respond, and, and responding in the moment to, you know, like this is discourse. This is ultimately what we all desire. This is why we all get into this. Is this is this is the discourse that we all seek. And it's, it, yeah, like that's one of the things that I think was most exciting about this project is just imagining, imagining that room and, and, and being reminded of why it's so, especially during COVID, as we're all trapped inside our houses, being reminded why it's so important for us to gather, why it's so important for us specifically of, you know, of these, you know, marginalized communities, why it's so important for us to gather with one another and have these conversations in real time. Um, and what can come, you know, what can come out of it, what can be generated, what new is produced from, um, from those relationships and from that coming together. Um, have you been personally changed by this project? And if so, how? I mean, I definitely have. 
I, I think this has been the most, like one of the most exciting, probably the most exciting and inspiring project I've ever worked on. And I think it's similar to, you know, what I was saying. I think it's, it's generated a lot for me and given me a lot of um, direction in terms of how the work that I would like to be doing and sort of, you know, how I see the work that needs to be done and my place within it. Um, I think it's been, yeah, it's been a project that uh, will lead to, to a lot more projects um, that will lead to a lot more projects in the future. Um, Julie? Yeah, I, you know, um, how have I been changed by this project? I think one of the, um, it's nice to, I received the first tapes from um, outright well over 10 years ago, probably maybe even 12 or 14 years ago. Somebody was like cleaning out and said, oh, you're interested in lesbian print culture. Here are these tapes. Um, and I've been carrying them around. Um, so so one of the things is um, it's nice to see um, projects come to fruition. Like I feel like that when things come to fruition, one of the things it does is gives more confidence of like, let's try, let's try the next project. Um, and that, you know, that kind of part of the change is always um, a sort of sense of confidence or ability to take on the next thing. Um, so I think that's one piece. Uh, you know, I was um, a, an activist and around during the 90s and knew about the outright conferences, but never went to them. Um, and so I also feel, um, so, so I feel like this in some ways is, is the apology to my younger self that I never got to the conference that like, but uh, I didn't get to the conference, but I got to explore it um, and think about it um, in these ways. It's also, it's prompted me to rethink um, how I think about the 1990s and, um, and activism and print activism and publishing during this time. Um, I think it tells a story of um, publishing that's important for us to think about because there was this um, flowering and this, the, this great acceptance of queer authors in the mid nineties by commercial publishing houses. Um, and, um, and, and we can kind of trace some of that trajectory through some of these speeches um, and think about, um, you know, the kind of perpetual question of mine is, um, you know, is commercial publishing our friend as in as LGBTQ people, um, or are there other? Uh, and and I think there are times that it can be, um, but I think it is not a long term faithful friend. I think it is a more of a feckless friend. Commercial publishing may be like the Democrats, um, which may just enrage some of your viewers, but I, um, but that can be my, you know, that's my statement. Um, so those are, those are the things that are coming out for me um, from having, from um, having this book out in the world and the things I'm, I'm thinking about. And you're right. They, I think that tension between mainstream and small press runs through the book, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's an ongoing concern for all of us now too. Well, this leads me to one of my last questions, which is what are you working on now? What's next for each of you? You can start, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I'm, all, like, I'm always working on a sinister wisdom issue. That's one of the things about being a quarterly publication that the, the schedule is relentless, um, which, I, which, which I must like in some way. Um, but, I, you know, I'm working on two, uh, I'm working on a couple new projects. One is um, I'm finishing a copy edit for a collection of poems by a poet named Lynn Lonadier, um, which Sinister Wisdom will publish later this year, maybe early next year. Um, it's another, it's like the Pat Parker project. Um, when I finished um, Parker, I said I'd never do like another big collection of a single um, poet's work. And yet here I am again. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, I'm working on finishing the, the book that Anne, you and I have talked about of lesbian feminist publishing, um, which continues to, um, 
I, I continue to press away at that, hoping to, to get that finished. Um, and then I'm also, I'm of course, always working on new poems. And you have a collection coming out, is that right? No, no, it's the Lana Deer that I oh, have. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. um, before we get to Elena, let's talk about your immediate future and the immediate uh, promotion of this book. Some of the events will have occurred by the time we air, but you have a couple of other um, items you'd like to share with us. Right, on April 10th at three o'clock, we'll be at the Bureau of General Services Queer Division inside the LGBT Center in New York City. Um, and we'll be with Mariana Romo Carmona and um, Linda Villarosa and Reggie, the poet Reggie Harris and Elena and I. So we invite people to join us in New York. Um, look at the Bureau's website to sign up. And we'll also be with the LGBT History Project in Boston um, via Zoom on June 30th. And we're still putting together the panel for that, um, but we'll be announcing that at outrightspeeches.com. Wonderful. So Elena, what are you working on now? What's your current or upcoming, what are your upcoming projects? Um, so kind of the, the one that, uh, takes up the most of my time is my is my day job. Um, I am the uh, director of exhibitions and curatorial affairs at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. Um, but outside of you know kind of what I do there, um, I have a few uh, writing projects for uh, responding to specific artists' um, work that are coming up this this spring. Um, one is a uh, catalog essay for. Um, an artist, Angela Hennessy, for her solo exhibition. Um, there's another work that I'm working on for the artist, Adia Millet, um, as well as a few um, smaller, there's a work that's coming out in light work this summer on the work of Dion Lee. Um, but really in terms of what I think, you know, my next big project would be is I'm very interested in diving, you know, this is really like open the floodgates for me in terms of like, um, work that I would like to do and um, areas that I'd like to study. And so I'm really interested in um, in learning more about specifically uh, queer culture at the end of the 20th century um, and uh, lesbian enclaves of artists and writers and how um, visual artists were connecting um, with poets and writers and this uh, thinking through abstraction as a vehicle for um, expressing uh, queer, specifically uh, lesbian identity and resistance. Um, and so that's something that I'm hoping will evolve into a academic practice um, in hopefully the next couple of years um, as I uh, begin uh, thinking about going back to going back to graduate school. Um, so what's striking is that, you know, when you were asked to write about um, by the outlook people when you were asked to write that you focused on the outright so mm -hmm. that would indicate an ongoing interest in yes material exactly yeah this is not the end this is not the end of this project by any means um, this is just the beginning the scratching oh, of the surface we look forward to seeing what comes next from each of you and we have a little time so do you have any last words that you'd like to share with the audience <laughs> Talk out. <laughs> well, let me thank you then. Neither of you, it, the book is widely available. Let me encourage everybody to pick it up. You'll find it really rewarding, full of all kinds of interesting. And, for, yes, and I'll put the, uh, the, a copy of the cover on the screen also. Well, thank you very much, both of you. And, uh, You'll have to come back again and keep us posted on what you're up to. It's been lovely. Yes, thank, thank you so much for inviting you. us. This was wonderful. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.